Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway, and only me today. Joseph is on honeymoon, and Gayatri will be back from maternity leave next week, God willing. I have a long history with Pakistan. I hold the country's two highest civil awards, the halal e azam for my work on the restoration of democracy in the country in the 1980s, and the halal e pakistan for my work on the issue of Kashmir over more than 30 years. I have the closest possible relationship with Pakistanis in Britain too, and so events unfolding there now are of the greatest possible interest to me, but also should be to you. The old war horse Nawaz Sharif is back in office, if not in power, as Prime Minister again. The last time he was Prime Minister, the army overthrew him, and they just might be about to do so again. The proximate cause is a mass uprising involving hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of the capital, Islamabad, alleging corruption, cronyism, and incompetence. Most Pakistanis think the protesters may have a point. This street power, though, doesn't have the international support of some other recent examples, but that doesn't mean it's doomed to fail. Joining us to try to make sense of it all is Murtaza Ali Shah, a famous UK-based Pakistani journalist and broadcaster. Murtaza, thanks for joining us. Let's deal with the numbers first. Is it a mass uprising? Are there hundreds of thousands of people? There are actually thousands of people. Um, uh, it's a very significant number of people who have come out on the streets of Islamabad. And the fact that these people have come to the capital of Pakistan really, you know, makes it quite significant. And uh, there is live 24-7 coverage in the whole world. Actually, you know, watching Pakistan is uh, taking a keen interest in what is unfolding in Islamabad. There are two parties which have brought their followers to Islamabad to uh, seeking resignation of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Uh, a, a religious leader, Dr. Tarul Qadri's party, who has uh, with him about uh, 30,000 uh, plus followers. And then Imran Khan's Pakistan, Tariq Insaf, who traveled all the way from Lahore to Islamabad. Uh, he had his, uh, like initially came with about 25 to 30,000 people, but uh, his uh, sit-in is uh, kind of different from uh, the, uh, Dr. Tarul Qadri's sit-in because Imran Khan's followers, uh, you know, in the morning time, uh, late at night, they go home and they assemble again in the evening while Dr. Tarul Qadri's followers are sitting there, living there, and they are uh, constantly staying there. But yes, there are very significant numbers, just a few hundred meters away from Prime Minister's house, uh, which is called the Red Zone area. And uh, that presence there makes it all the more important. Is he nervous, the Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif? Perhaps not nervous about the numbers being able to force him out, but being able to, uh, as it were, precipitate yet another military junta intervening. You are absolutely right. I mean, there is a lot of not only nervousness, but uh, there is fear within you know, uh, the government and opposition circles that there may be a bigger conspiracy at play. Because what has happened here is that Imran Khan and Qadri, you know, they initially said that they are two very different actors, you know, not acting in unison or anything like that. But they left Lahore on the same day. They arrived at the same time. And then they started their march from Islamabad uh, to breach the red zone, which was prohibited by the Supreme Court and by the Pakistani government. They have so far almost acted in unison. And that is what makes Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and including the main opposition parties kind of nervous. They believe that there are probably some forces, you know, though one of those hidden hands who may be, you know, pulling their strings. So far, it looks that there is certain section within the Pakistan establishment which is supporting these elements. But Nawaz Sharif has met uh, the chief of army staff, General Rahil Sharif. Uh, his brother, uh, Shabazz Sharif, has met him. Uh, today, Nawaz Sharif appeared before Pakistan National Assembly. He had grin on, a, grin on his face. He looked confident. And the National Assembly unanimously today has passed a resolution rejecting the unconstitutional and illegal demands made by Imran Khan and uh, Dr. Tahirul Qadri. Now, viewers will be familiar with Imran Khan, formerly a great uh, international cricketer, 
uh, reformed his life, became a kind of Islamist uh, yeah. leader, has several times now promised to break through into power in Pakistan, but not managed to do so. But probably most people will not have heard of the second fellow. He's a Canadian citizen. Tell us about him. What's his religious political agenda? Well, Dr. Qadri actually he comes from very humble beginnings. He used to work for a religious school which was run by Sharif's family, Nawaz Sharif and Shabazz Sharif's family. And then he set up, he is from moderate Sunni section of Islam. He's not one of those extremists. He's one of those peers and, you know, holy spiritual figures. Uh, but the difference between him and other, you know, spiritual figures is that now Dr. Qadri, you know, he wants to get into power. But what he, does he want to do with it? Has he got an agenda? Well, he only, he probably has an agenda, but he does not know how to get into power because the last time he stood in elections, he won only one seat. And he, later on, he, uh, you know, submitted resignation and he left Pakistan. He sought asylum in Canada. So Dr. Qadri wants to get into power, but he knows that if he goes to the elections, he cannot win. But again, he wants into power. So he wants some sort of military coup. He wants some sort of intervention from divine forces or from military establishment for, from so who, whosoever, whichever power who could actually put him into power. Now, that is where he gets very confused and the people like, you know, his followers are there, but the rest of the Pakistanis do not take him seriously. He has very good words to say. He talks, you know, a lot of, makes a lot of sense about a lot of things that he says, but everybody understands that he does not have the power or, you know, the number of people that are required to put him in through a legitimate democratic process. So he wants some kind of, you know, a new Pakistan where through a miracle he could get into power. That is not going to happen uh, as long as Pakistan is a functioning democratic country. If there is a coup, if there is, you know, kind of, an, you know, a massive uprising or a situation where the whole system is put upside down, that is the only chance Qadri has. On the other hand, Imran Khan has a large number of, you know, genuine followers. He has been through political process. Now he has a lot of presence in Pakistan National Assembly. He won elections in, in one of the most crucial provinces of Pakistan, Khabar Pakhtunkhwa, which borders Afghanistan. He has a government there. Now the very, you know, interesting thing here is that Imran Khan has power in one province. He is crying that there has been mass scale rigging in elections. He is not talking about the province which he rules, but he's believes that there has been rigging in Punjab. He believes he was cheated in Lahore and cheated also in Karachi. The whole struggle is actually about Punjab. And that's where he is focusing on. Because, you know, the power base in Pakistan is Punjab. He, Imran Khan, frankly speaking, did not want to rule Khabar Pakhtunkhwa. He won it and he's in a state of dilemma. I mean, you know, he has mm. to now do something. It's quite a hot potato ruling. It's a hot potato, uh, indeed, there. yes. Now, we both know, uh, sadly, that for almost exactly half of its existence. Pakistan has lived under military rule. Yeah. Uh, so governments come to power and habitually they're then overturned and there's a period of military rule followed by a return to democracy and so on, as regular as clockwork. That uh, process by which you said uh, Nawaz Sharif met the chief of army staff and had a smile on his face, there have been other Pakistani leaders who have met chiefs of staff and emerged with smile on their face, only later to be overthrown. Uh, tell us about the chief of army staff. Is he the kind of fellow that might do as his predecessors have done? It looks difficult at this stage. I mean, although uh, it's a fact that Pakistan army is uh, upset with Nawaz Sharif on a lot of issues, especially on the issue of Parvez Musharraf. This is the former military uh, former chief military who became chief, yes. a dictator president. Absolutely. And now Nawaz Sharif actually is trying him through courts and wants to indict him on treason charges and a lot of, you know, other charges. That has hugely upset Pakistan army. And uh, many commentators actually say that a lot of, you know, the, the movement that is going on right now has its links with the Pakistan army's anger with Nawaz Sharif's policies. But the difficulty with Pakistan army would be that uh, it was, you can see only recently that Musharraf has been there in power and his you know, if, if, if the fact that he was in the power, there was rise in militancy in Pakistan. Pakistan went into coalition with America and it did not bring any good name to Pakistan army. It looks like that Pakistan army will not do any direct intervention. It can be, you know, soft kind of intervention, intervention through Dr. Qadri and Imran Khan, but uh, it will be very difficult for Pakistan army to actually just literally go for mm. an all out uh, coup. 
بیکاز دیٹ ول ڈیفینیٹلی ناٹ بی ایکسپٹیڈ بائی دا پیپل آف پاکستان اینڈ دین دیٹ میکس نواز شریف لک لائک اے وکٹم Now, the elections were uh, clear enough by Pakistani standards. Nawaz Sharif won them quite handsomely. Yeah. One of the claims by these twin columns of oppositionists is that these elections were rigged, were they? Yes, elections were not perfect. Uh, they were rigged in some parts, but uh, they were not rigged in the manner that Imran Khan... Imran Khan's allegation is that elections were rigged because he did not win. Mm. If Imran Khan had won, he would not have cried, you know, any kind of rigging. Now, Imran Khan, you know, the way it happened, Imran Khan may have actually, I mean, he does not talk. I mean, Khaber Pakhtunkhwa, he won really, you know, a handsome majority. So he thinks that is fine. Rigging took place all over Pakistan, but that was because of the flaws in Pakistan's electoral system. It's not, it does not mean that Imran Khan was actually, there was a conspiracy to mm. rig elections against him. Imran Khan because... The rigging took place against many other moderate parties, including, you know very well, the Muteda Qumi movement and the Awami National Party in Pakistan People's Party, mm. Benzir Bhutto's party. They were literally in some areas not allowed to run election campaign because Taliban were, you know, attacking them, murdering them, killing them all yes, over. Yes. So there was, I mean, these are like elections were really rigged in many, many ways, but it does not mean that they were rigged particularly against Imran Khan or in favor of Nawaz Sharif. Just uh, quickly, Murtaza, is the Pakistani media covering all that's happening in Islamabad? Are they allowed to? Are TV stations being closed down and so on? George, Pakistani media has not covered anything else since this whole uh, you know movement started. That is the only news story in Pakistan. Nothing else matters. Now, many people are saying that if only Pakistani TV channels are switched off, the revolution will die down. But because there is coverage 24-7 on two camps and just yes, Pakistan is really hooked to what is happening and Imran Khan and Dr. Tarul Qadri are aware of this fact and to keep the people entertaining, they have introduced many live music acts, you know, Bhangra, pop, rock, lot of acts into their uh, respective crowds, you know, uh, keep the people and themselves entertained. So, yes. Uh, and is the weather good enough to keep them there? Or? It's quite hot, yes, but uh, it's fine. It's, it's better than before. Well... We'll watch it with interest. Murtaza, thanks Thank for uh, enlightening us on what's happening in Pakistan. Coming up after the break, we're remembering the slave trade, Britain's role in it, and the total failure to make reparation for one of the greatest crimes of modern history. Don't miss it. I'll be right back. Welcome back to Sputnik. Thousands of African Americans are protesting on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, and some of them are being metaphorically lynched by white overseers, otherwise known as the police. But how did so many Africans end up in America? Just like the black people in Britain, mainly from the Caribbean, they are the descendants of slaves, men and women who were chained and shackled, thrown into the holds of leaking vessels, sailed across the Atlantic, and sold as beasts of burden to white plantation owners. All concerned made an unhealthy profit, except for the slaves, whose lives were nasty, brutish, and short. On board the Sputnik today, we have historian, writer, and broadcaster S.I. Martin, who wanted to talk about UNESCO's International Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its Abolition, which is today. The reason Slavery Remembrance Day is on the 23rd of August is to mark the anniversary of the first successful slave uprising. It took place in 1791 in Santo Domingo, now Haiti. I thought Ferguson, Missouri was the perfect backdrop in front of which to do so. Tell us, please, if I'm right about that. Are we seeing in Ferguson a part of the legacy of the slave trade, the abolition of which we are commemorating today? Yes, there's a definite and very, very clear uh, continuity behind the attitudes which resulted in the rioting in uh, Ferguson and the legacy of the slave trade and the, the, move, the buying and selling of human beings, especially in North America. We have to remember, even after being... Um, uh, e even after uh, partial abolition, the life of a black person was in law less. Um, a white man, a white person, usually a white man, had no... Uh, need to respect any of the rights that a black person had. And this is manifested in the treatment of an alleged uh, 
um, criminal or lower class uh, person of African origin like Michael Brown and in the treatment up to including Barack Obama who as president is just held to much stricter laws, much stricter, uh, tighter focus on his behavior and his responses than um, any of his white predecessors. So we are still living with this legacy. It's not gone yet. And it's not ancient history because no. Barack Obama's father mm -hmm. would not have been allowed to, to take his lunch mm -hmm. at the same counter as a white person yeah. in the 90, early 1960s, in the late 1950s. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing that we do forget, that it is within the lifetimes of many of us. And there's always an urge just to try and forget, to say, well, 1964, um, um, all of the uh, civil rights legislation which passed after that um, has drawn a curtain over it. And it's like, an, uh, it's like a live rail. Um, when you're talking about any sorts of histories, all sorts of atrocities can be discussed freely, relatively openly. But when you talk about enslavement, especially in Great Britain and in the United States to a lesser degree, it's something that people flinch away from. And um, it's, you know, the rem Remembrance Day is part of adjusting the focus on that. Well, uh, we'll talk about Britain. That's an interesting point. Um, but let's uh, pause to remember that great slave uprising. Mm in Haiti, what is now Haiti, which uh, overthrew slavery. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a tendency in the West, in Britain and elsewhere, to think that slavery was ended by benevolent old mm. white men yeah. who couldn't countenance such cruelty. Mm -hmm. uh, but in part, of course, it yeah. was the threat of revolution Absolutely. in the slave, slave areas mm. Uh, that terrified them. Tell us about that uprising. Oh, I'd say, George, it's more than the threat of revolution. It's the reality of it. We have to remember that every 10 to 15 years, um, actually every 10 years, there'd be a major uprising um, throughout the Caribbean um, or Latin America, and large numbers of white British lives were lost. Um, so this was a constant danger. Tell me about this country, because it's easy for us to cluck, cluck about the American police. Yeah shooting down black people in Ferguson, Missouri, mm. but there's a temptation to forget that uh, policemen have shot down black people here in London and elsewhere in Britain. To what extent is the United States only, as in many things, mm. a bigger and more brash expression of the kind of racism that underpinned slavery than we have here in Britain, but actually not that much different? Yeah, yeah, this is an interesting one, because although it is different, there are very clear differences due to the fact that there wasn't plantation slavery in these islands. And you did have people who were enslaved, but you also had people of African origin living here for centuries who were free. And this has sort of blurred the interpretation of um, enslavement and how African population origin people are treated here, because slavery, enslavement was something that to the majority of people happened out of sight, out of mind. And compounded to that, you have the reality that with the abolition movement, you have the first genuine mass popular movement in this country, which went across classes and even reluctantly for men of the great, many of the great and good, included women. So it's a little bit more nuanced than the United States, but the fundamental deal is still there. The fundamental elements are still in position. Um, who are these populations of African origin now that um, they have um, been given um, a, a, s a small part of freedom. What do we do with them? How do we treat them? Um, what are their civil rights? So the same story does play out on both sides of the Atlantic. But one of the major things is that in these islands, we tend to um, compare ourselves constantly with um, America. America seems the super reality. And um, there's a very overly favorable attitude to um, the fact that the British um, uh, emancipated uh, many of their enslaved people in 1833. The Americans had, well, they'd taken another 33 years to do the same. So there's a lot of um, self-congratulatory back patting which goes on, which really obscures the reality that, no, uh, enslavement didn't really end right there and right then. It was an ongoing, long, drawn-out process which was still taking parts in other parts of the uh, British Empire. And the mentality mm. that justified it, because mm. clearly you could only enslave another human being if your mm. underlying assumption was yes. that he was in your inferior, yes. you were his superior, yeah. hasn't uh, died even a century yeah. later. In the United mm. States, in Ferguson, it's clear. Mm. And you could say that in uh, some recent incidents, 
uh, here in London and elsewhere in the United Kingdom, mm. the same mentality that black people are a problem yep. that has to be contained. Absolutely. And if necessary, mm. with gunfire. Yeah, I mean, this couldn't be more clear than um, with your, um, in, in the incident illustrated in your opening remarks. I mean, we've just seen um, all sorts of exotic weaponry and firearms being used against um, the citizenry of uh, Ferguson, Missouri. But compare and contrast that to the response at the Bundy Ranch in Nevada, where you had hundreds of white men who were armed, many of them with automatic weapons, trained on local, national and federal officials, who agreed to just reason with them peacefully and ultimately back down and um, take the back seat in front of this awesome display of firepower. Had those um, individuals um, um, in Nevada been of African origin, I think we know what the outcome would have been. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about that. Mm. And Barack Obama hasn't made much of a difference. No. It's a pitiful epitaph to a pitiful mm. presidency that he's mm. looking towards the end of his term now. Mm -hmm. He's on Martha's vineyard mm -hmm. having a whale of a time, yeah, yeah. whilst black people in America are being gunned down in Missouri. Yes, but that's inevitable. I mean, we've seen this play out time and again during his presidency. Um, he does not and he cannot feel in a position to come out um, literally all guns blazing on the part of um, his uh, uh, black fellow citizens because he will be branded as a firebrand. Here is someone <laughs> for whom a large portion of the American uh, voting public has enormous resentment. They call him all sorts of names. He's a fascist as well as being a socialist. Um, he's a godless atheist as well as being a Muslim. Um, he's an elitist as well as being a thug. He is contained and controlled um, by public opinion and public responses, majority population that is, in the same way as the populations on Ferguson are controlled um, by now National Guardsmen and well, local yeah, uh, police. But he doesn't have to face, can't face any more elections. This is we true. We could be seeing now, if mm -hmm. he wanted us to, the real Barack Obama. That and would be I, I, presume, I presume that's what we are seeing. Uh, tell us about the UNESCO Day. Mm -hmm. How is it marked? What's the point of it? What should people do about it? Okay, um, the UNESCO Day for the International um, Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its abolition is basically a way of keeping the conversation going. It's a way of talking about the largest forced uh, mass movement of uh, people in human history and its ongoing legacy and impacts. And um, by way of marking it, um, various points around the world, particularly here in London at the National Maritime Museum in uh, Liverpool, um, there are a day's worth of events to just focus on the lives that were lost and the cost that was paid. Uh, it's just a way of keeping the conversation going and uh, remembering that unbelievable loss of human life. What about reparation? How mm. stands the... Uh, because, I mean, for example, the, the other Holocaust, yeah, yeah. Uh, with a capital H, mm -hmm. in which millions and millions mm. of people perished, is subject to a lot of reparations, yeah. uh, financial, political, uh, many other kinds of reparations. The slave trade, equally a holocaust, yeah. uh, remains uh, unrepaired. Yes, no right. one has paid anything mm. to the people who yeah. are the descendants of those who suffered that. Yes, because again, underlying that difference in response is the perceived and enforce different in difference in value between various populations groups. And clearly, you know, even talking about this, as I said before, it's a live wire. Talking and broaching the subject of this crime, which is what it was, these series of crimes, is extraordinarily difficult. And the subject of reparations, it comes up all the time. Um, CARICOM, the CARICOM countries, the Caribbean uh, Economic Community, um, they drafted a set of proposals to uh, jumpstart dialogue with European nations. It was beautifully crafted, um, v uh, full of elegant jurisprudence and ethics and morality and all of the other elements which are, which um, entities like national governments and um, multinational companies would are specifically formed to ignore, ignore. It's a strange one, this, because Though the movement for reparations is growing um, within populations of African origin, 
um, I think more tools are needed because the tools that have been used before, um, various forms of um, legal approaches, the moral approach, kumbayaism as I call it, I'm not sure they're going to be working. You don't think they'll ever be paying up? Not based on an appeal to reason or an appeal to common humanity, because when we're talking about they, we are talking about national governments and multinational corporations who do not respond to that, who cannot. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik or on Facebook. You can like us at Sputnik on Russia Today. I've been George Galloway. It's been marvellous.